A bit lit, celebrating research and creativity of all kinds. Dee, Claire, it's absolutely wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be speaking today about um, your brilliant project, thinking about walking at a time of COVID. And I, I know myself just from my own experiences here. I mean, here we are on Zoom. I find myself these days only really walking from A to A, which is very confusing. Uh, and I found as lockdown has eased and I have to get from A to B, increasingly confusing. But I'm also speaking to you close to a, a little family of coots who every year um, have, have baby coots, which um, my local community entirely ignore. But in the last year and a half, those coots have become kind of local celebrities as people do start to take in their, their local area. So I'm really looking forward to learning from you ways of thinking about walking COVID access, et cetera. Um, we start our films by asking you to introduce yourselves and then to tell us about the project as well, please. Perhaps if we start with Dee. Hi, uh, Andy, thanks so much for the invitation to be here uh, to speak about the project today. It's great to have the opportunity. So I'm Dee Hedden and I am a professor of theatre studies at the University of Glasgow in the School of Culture and Creative Arts. And the massively wonderful thing about theatre is it's a very broad church umbrella. Um, so I actually don't do much work on theatres, in theatres. Uh, I've been focusing on walking for quite some time now uh, and thinking really, I guess, about walking as a mode of performance in itself. Um, both sort of a, a cultural practice and an aesthetic practice. Um, so I'm calling in today uh, from Glasgow in Scotland. Great, thank you. Claire? Hi, I'm Claire Corman. I'm an artist and a senior lecturer in um, drama, applied theatre and performance at the University of East London. And similarly to Dee, despite my location within the performing arts, my work uh, centres very much on walking, live art and performance art practices, along with kind of site specific performance, participatory practice mm. and socially social practice, I suppose it's often described as, as a field of, of art. And I make work myself as an artist, as well as researching and teaching in that area. And Great. I'm in London. Fantastic, thank you. And by participatory and social practice, just for those who are unfamiliar with that, um, so this is something about bringing the audience into the work is that right yeah that's right yeah so rather than imagining an artwork where an audience sits and watches or reads or listens participatory practice involves people in the actual making mm -hmm. so sometimes that's described as the people being the material or um people being kind of co-creators or creative contributors to the piece so quite often with participants participatory art the work wouldn't exist without those people taking part which is often the case for example with a group walk yeah perfect thank you very much um and Dee, you talked about walking and performance and as someone who sometimes walks around listening with music on shuffle whenever michael jackson's kind of early 80s music comes on i'm always aware of what that does to my method of walking um which is a slightly odd version of of that but um yeah how those things intersect um, but we're here today to talk about uh, walking publics, walking arts, walking wellbeing and community during COVID-19. Can I get you to introduce that project as well? Yeah, so um, it's an 18 month project that's funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, uh, which is our funder that really funds research in the arts and humanities. Um, and it is a project that is seeking to explore two things really. Um, how people experienced walking during COVID-19 in the UK and across the UK, and I guess through the various stages of lockdown and less lockdown and more lockdown. Um, so did the experience of walking change across you know, the past 18 months? And if so, how? Uh, also importantly within that, um, have folk walked more or less? Have they had more challenges or less challenges? Has their engagement with walking shifted? Have they walked, you know, thinking about the challenges uh, for some folk they were shielding for months and months um, and so what did walking mean to the folk who perhaps were shielding within their house and didn't have a garden for example so not to sort of just presume that there's a sort of narrative I think that everyone was out walking more and I think we're interested to find out well is that the case and um, so that's that's one part of the project how were folk walking and if they weren't walking why might that not be or how might we reconceive of what walking even means to incorporate for example virtual walking or imaginative walking does it have to be done you know, outside on foot. 
etc. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of the project is exploring how artists have adapted or extended or developed their arts practice to include walking as a material or as a resource or as, a, or as, an, as a, an arts output really. Um, and there are actually a lot of artists already across the UK who would identify as walking artists uh, who regularly use walking as part of their practice. It's a material that they have embedded and engaged with perhaps for many years now. Um, so we're interested to know how they adapted their work to these new conditions. So if, for example, as Claire says, a participatory walk <laughs> might typically have been done in a small group together in shared space and time, and then along comes COVID and makes walking in groups no longer possible. Uh, so what do you do as an artist to, uh, to, to, to manage that situation and still be able to engage or develop or build community mm -hmm. um, in spite of physical distancing? Uh, so we think we've got things to learn from those artists about adaptation, creative adaptation, uh, you know, meeting the challenge and actually thinking creatively about that and seeing it as a, as a creative opportunity as much as a barrier. Um, but secondly, we've become increasingly aware, Andy, of how more folk are turning to walking who maybe hadn't used walking before as an arts practice or performance practice. And we use art very broadly. So we don't just mean visual art. So, you know, theatre practitioners turning to the walk as a form of theatre practice. And um, if you look at the festivals being programmed across the UK this summer, it's remarkable how many of them now have walks within them. And we'd need to do a bit of historical study there to see if that is actually a trend that was there last year and the year before, and we're just alert to it now, or whether in fact it's because it's one of the practices that has been allowed in a safe bet, really, not knowing what's going to happen through the summer. Are we going to go back into lockdown or not into lockdown? And um, so I think there's something to, useful to study here about how are artists recognizing walking as an innovative creative resource really um, and, and a new way to think about practice and connectivity and community. That's completely fascinating and uh, in a moment I'm going to hand over to Claire to tell us a bit more about what you might mean by the kind of idea of, of walking art um, and I'm a little bit worried in all of these films I worry that I say all the all the, the obvious things that everyone always says to our contributors so I apologize if this is sort of obvious stuff but I'm really thinking about things like the West Wing and the way the West Wing often gets thought of as having those like the, the kind of big technical detail people remember about the West Wing is uh, actors walking down the corridor, down very busy corridors, frenetically swapping bits of prose um, and both the idea of busy government professionals doing that, but also actors doing that and then a film set having to do that. Um, it's kind of fascinating to think about kind of confluences there of just how alert and aware the audience then becomes to walking and performance. That's true. Um, that's a new that's a new uh, case study for us then, Andy, that we've not thought about. Great. <laughs> uh, but Claire, yeah, would you mind telling us more about um, about this the very concept of walking art? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So um, I should say, as with any kind of definition of of art, this is debatable and variable. But I would say that walking art is defined by the centering of walking as an act at, at, within the practice. Yeah. So there are many artists, for example, who are inspired by the walks that they do, either in their writing or their painting or their photography or in their, their writing. Whereas I would say walking art slightly differently from that makes the walk the center of the activity. So you have to kind of experience the walk in order to have experienced the artwork. Now that can happen in a number of different ways. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're there with the artist going on some sort of guided tour. It could equally mean that you take a set of instructions, a map or a guide or some other kind of toolkit that tells you what to do but that you enact it and equally as Dee touched upon I'd include in my category of walking art um, works that invite the audience to imagine a walk perhaps that they've been on before so I would say yeah in its simplest in my simplest definition it's artwork where the walk is at the absolute centre Maybe Dee would like to add to that. I don't know. What do you think, Dee? No, I think that's good in its openness. Do you know, we're not, it's not a restrictive definition. Um, yeah, but so the, 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 the walk is the art in whatever form that walk takes, I guess, really. Yeah, yeah I, I, really, I really love that. And I don't, wanna, I, don't, I don't mean to play against the openness of it, but I wonder if we could get some examples um, just to help 
the audience to kind of think through what that might look like um, in practice. Would that be all yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, I, I maybe I'll start with an art. I mean, Claire and I do both do walking art, but I'd like to use the platform, first of all, perhaps to just, you know, uh, center um, another artist, Sonia Overall, uh, in part because uh, Sonia has been leading, facilitating, and I don't know if the leading is the right word in this participatory practice, but facilitating uh, weekly walks every Sunday uh, from the moment lockdown started and has not missed a Sunday in doing that. Um, and they were made in response to the fact that folk couldn't meet together and they just used digital technology. So Twitter, um, WhatsApp, those are the sort of modes of communication. And Sonia takes that idea of the drift, um, you know, drifting through space, drifting through place. Um, but she sets creative prompts every week that may be attached to a theme. So, for example, uh, one Sunday it was the blue moon, you know, the big large blue moon that sometimes we have the privilege of seeing. And from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock on that Sunday morning, anyone who wanted to could join through that virtual technology really. Um, and Sonia would send maybe eight, maybe every 10 minutes a different creative prompt. So for example, walking through your landscape, whether that's inside or outside, look out for the blue moons and document them. And suddenly your landscape changes because you're not any longer just walking down that street that you've walked down every day with a sense of utter boredom because it's the same street. Suddenly the landscape becomes a lunar landscape just filled with magic and the, you know, the grids on the road suddenly become pockmarked Mars or, um, you know, the sort of drains that are circles you suddenly realise actually have a set of sort of architectural beauty to them or design beauty to them. And then maybe the, the next prompt was uh, look for the spaceman on the moon. Um, and you'd be looking into folks' gardens going, where's the spaceman? What, you know, what could stand in for the spaceman? And you share pictures as you go or you upload them afterwards just on, twi just on, just on, on, on Twitter. Um, and just remarkable seeing how folk interpreted those creative prompts. And the hour passes like that. And I've really rediscovered a landscape that was so familiar to me and seen it in all sorts of different ways. And what's lovely about that is when I walk those same routes now, I can't help but see the blue moon everywhere. <laughs> um, so that's just like one example of a very simple sort of creative prompts that someone gives you and there's a sense of connectivity in spite of physical distance. None of us are in the same place. Um, we might even be coming in from different countries, different time zones, um, but all connected virtually through that idea of, you know, looking for the, turning the ordinary into the extraordinary actually, just through the act of creativity. I think that's one example. It's a, it's, um, it's brilliant. It's, it's called brilliant. distance drift. Hashtag distance drift. You know, it's really yeah. lovely, and the sort it's of commitment that someone has put to doing that every week, I think, is remarkable. And it's not the same folk who come in and out. I, I maybe do it once every four weeks, but there are some folk who join every week to participate mm. in that. It's a brilliant example, I think, and I, I kind of love that combination of drifting whilst also providing structure, sort of providing structure without providing inevitability and um, and keeping the participatory agent the person doing it in control of of what they do uh we've, we've made a film which will be coming out i think probably after yours with um um sasha coward who runs um workshops for uh museums particularly with people who otherwise feel excluded from museums and does kind of escape room and alternative modes of moving around the museum um yeah. with, with a very similar sort of structure and, and removes the structure being the kind of artifact to artifact um structure and we've also well, that's got so interesting andy because mm. claire has written a, has a collection of um publications called ways to wander and one of them is called ways to wander the museum mm. uh, ways to wander the gallery but i'm sorry ways to wander the gallery very Claire, close but yeah yeah very close and i mean though these books that there's brought together are filled with ways to walk creatively really i don't know that you've got any to hand i was looking for mine on my bookshelf here to go here's, yeah, here's you, an example Let me see if i can grab one right. here's an example of um, <laughs> I mean, and and these are contributed by artists so they're sort of a set of creative instructions for enlivening your sort of everyday walking practices really and yeah. um, and this one was me that she said expect i think it you we are. So this is Ways to Wander the Gallery, which was, so they're co-edited by me and Claire Hind, and this one was made in collaboration with uh, Tate Modern as part of a course that we taught there oh. um, in 2017-18, and then the, the first one, Ways to Wander, was uh, published in 2015, I think, but each of them uh, 
there's I think there are 48 contributors in Ways to Wonder and 18 contributors in Ways to Wonder the gallery. So they're a really diverse collection of um, of kind of instructions, guides, prompts, um, scores, different approaches to kind of sharing sharing a walk. Have you got one you could share? There. Yeah. Just to give an example of what that might like look like for a participant, because yeah. I think they're really lovely guides, books, and toolkits really for folk to use. So let's see. Here we go. Sorry, I'm looking for a shortish one. Okay, this is called the closer walk. And the instruction is, there is the sidewalk and you are walking in the middle. There is the path and you are walking in the middle. Shift your route, start a new way by walking closer. Walk close to the walls, facades, hedges, fences. Walk as close as you can without touching them. Do it around a house, around a block, along a road. Do it at places you think you already know. Do it at places you want to get to know. And that one is by a uh, Swiss artist called Marianne Lergen. Um, but yes, short but sweet, a lovely instruction. Yeah, a set of instructions which turn walking into a performative game. Yeah, exactly that. yeah absolutely. Yeah, that's absolutely fascinating. D you mentioned at the outset questions around access. Um, and I guess I'd be, I'd be interested to hear, hear from both of you about um, how, how that works for this project, given that there are people who for physical and uh, all kinds of structural and domestic um, and indeed timekeeping reasons can't can't walk, um, but, but may still be going on the kinds of journeys you're talking about or may not be. Um, yeah. Are there ways of thinking about walking in ways which are um, inclusive of such people? Yeah, so in some senses, so just to just to explain, we've, we've um, issued two surveys as the beginning of the project really to get both quantitative, so it's numbers, and qualitative, you know, more reflective comments and thoughts around how folk have experienced walking. And one of those is to the members of the public, and one of those is to artists, although we're uncomfortable about that division, mm -hmm. and because everyone has, you know, cr is creative, um, and artists are members of the public. But for the sake of the research method, that's how we structured those surveys, and folk can fill in both if they want. Mm -hmm. um, and the public survey is, is indeed asking folk to um, give examples of how they might have used creative practice within their own walking everyday practices um, from you know, um, A to Z. I don't know whether you know the sort of A to Z spot something from all the way through the alphabet on your walk until you've covered the A to Z or you know, nature bingo, uh, stone trails that folk have made to, you know, just to enliven folks walk. So we're sort of soliciting examples really of creative acts that folk have encountered on their walks or creative acts that they've undertaken and that framework of creativity is very broad um, and it's self-inclusive. But as I, as I intimated earlier, we're also seeking to understand uh, what challenges folk have felt and they will vary in, you know, very widely for all sorts of reasons, um, including, as you said, just access to walk, but health, um, fear, anxiety, levels of confidence, actually medical instruction to stay indoors, don't go out. Um, and so we we don't know yet, with the surveys closed just recently, and we don't know yet what the challenges folk have told us are. Uh, so one of the jobs of analysis is to um, look at those and review those and understand the varieties of those and any, coral, any sort of connection between sort of demographic information and um, urban, you know, we've asked folk, do you have a garden, for example? And that might impact whether folk go out walking more <laughs> or not. Um, or if folk don't go out more, is that because they don't have a garden, et cetera? So we're sort of trying to have some sort of sense of sort of cultural, social uh, difference and variety there really. Um, and thinking then about what those challenges might be. Um, but on the other side of that, we've also asked the artists to explain what work they've made and how that is accessible to other folk or what type of participation it calls for. Um, so to take another really good example, uh, Louise Ann Wilson um, is another, another artist and very early at lockdown, in lockdown, well, she'd been thinking about this thing Andy called um, surrogacy walking. 
<laughs> so how can you be a surrogate for someone who can't walk? And there's another artist in Scotland called Alec Finlay, who's a poet actually, um, who also uses the term proxy walking. So they're sort of working in similar territory here, excuse the pun. Um, in terms of if you're unable to walk, what types of creative frameworks might be there to see whether you can at least translate some of the pleasures of walking? Um, and those pleasures, you know, may be about being outside, but they may also just be about the sort of imaginative, um, you know, distractions, diversions, interruptions into your everyday that walking provides, and could those be accessed in other ways than physically getting out of your house and walking? And so Louise, very early on, um, staged, mounted a, a creative practice project called Memory Walks, um, where she invited you to spend time drawing the walk that was a favourite walk of yours, um, and just taking the time to do that, and mm. thinking through the detail of that walk, and uh, how you felt about it and you know what was important on that walk and she's collected those and she's going to exhibit those in a gallery really um, uh, uh, quite soon just to show again that actually when I did that task although I because I couldn't get to the walk it was two and a half hours outside, hours outside of Glasgow and then um, we were in lockdown uh, so I wasn't able to visit for about a year hmm. just doing that activity of like imaginatively retracing the steps of that walk and I, it, I did it I, I, the drawing took the same amount of time, two and a half hours, as it would have taken me to do the walk. There was something absolutely immersive about that, in the way that walking can be immersive and meditative. It was, you know, I just did, and I, I've got no art skills <laughs> in terms of visual art. You know, I just did like marks on the paper. It's not a great drawing by any stretch of the imagination, but it was immersive and it just took me out of the four walls that I suddenly felt very entrapped by. Um, so, so looking for examples, like that, where actually it isn't about physical ability, it isn't about access to rural landscapes, getting out of the city. It's it's a journey of the of the mind, really, and it can be cont contemplative in a way that you might not anticipate. Um, so, so in some senses, perhaps there is a resonance there with the contemplation of that idyllic romantic walk, just as one example. Um, Claire, I don't know whether you've anything else to add to that. I went on a bit there, yeah. sorry. No, I think just to add as well, that one thing we're aware of, I think probably from our quite extensive experience of working with walking, is that for, for many people, the automatic assumption when you talk about walking is a, is a hike, is a walk in the countryside or a longer walk. And actually we're equally interested in very short walks, very domestic, very everyday, very routine walks. In fact, predominantly my walking art practice really revolves around those walks. I don't really do big walks out in nature. So, and, and I actually think that that sort of desire to disrupt the understanding of what we mean by going for a walk is really important in terms of accessibility too, because we know for all different sorts of reasons, the countryside can be a bit intimidating, you know, for lack of access, for fear of remoteness, because of racism, because of uh, safety fears, all, all sorts of things uh, intersect and align to make those spaces not accessible for everyone so kind of re making sure that we're uh, really communicating that walking means your walk to tesco's or your school run or literally just going around your block to get a breath of fresh air at the end of the day is included in our uh, in our interest and our understanding of walking and so is, if I might just add, um, our understanding, recognition, and I guess advocacy for recognising that walking doesn't mean on two feet, and um, that one can go for a walk in a wheelchair, you know, one can go for a walk with walking aids, mm -hmm. and so sort of getting away from this notion of the bipedal walk, upright walk, and um, so we, we, we hope that the term walking becomes itself more inclusive, and away from that sort of dominant narrative of, you know, someone striding along, you know, very fast and capably on two feet, and, and in fact, you know, there are many different ways to walk. In fact, someone emailed me, an artist emailed me to say, well, actually, my, walk, my, my, my work is crawling, as in, you know, I'm crawling. <laughs> 
would that be included? And yes, because that's, you know, an, another form of walking. So yes, of course, <laughs> you know, fill in the survey and tell us about your crawling work. Um, so like stretching the parameters and understandings, I guess, of what we mean by walking, both where it's done, how it's done, and which bodies do it and how they do it, really. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. I love the concept of um, surrogacy and proxy. Yeah. And I think in addition to lockdown causing more walking and more reading, I think a lot more people have been playing computer games as well. And computer games seem to be like 95% surrogate walking uh walking characters around which is kind of fascinating um i've got two more questions for you and i've also got my eye on the time so i'm trying to think how best to kind of deploy the questions one is a, a kind of wider question about um creativity and walking and doing those two things together thinking about those two things together we've talked about walking art but kind of inviting you to think um in a way i've kind of boxed you into more specific questions there and thinking more broadly about what it means to bring those two together and then my second question, just in case you can answer both at the same time, is, is about the kind of gloriously open-ended nature of this project. Um, I don't really believe in research, which asks questions to which it already knows the answers. So I'm very excited by this aspect of your work, but thinking about the ways in which you are so open to the return of unexpected results. Um, those are completely separate questions and I apologize for throwing both of you at the same time, but creativity and walking, and the nature of this as a research project, I guess I'd, I'd love to hear more of to wrap up. Um, Claire, do you want to go first? Sorry, you were you were <laughs> right to go. go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I guess I'm not quite clear, Andy, what you mean by creativity and walking. So um, okay. I guess there is no limit on the potential of bringing those two things together. You know, creativity is without limit. And I mean, walking as a concept and then a practice, I mean, we've talked about it, but what's interesting is the, the very small scale can be limitless, like the, you know, the dimensions of it don't constrain it really. Um, so one could walk, you know, around one's block and see something different every single day, you know, even in a small patch of land. And some artists, really, that's their practice, looking at mm. the same thing, you know, over time and seeing how it changes. Um, Claire and I both have walking arts practices. So just to give another example, and then maybe Claire can go on first. I've got a project called the Walking Library, which brings together books uh, and walking. Um, do you know, and uh, it, it, it takes its cue from romantic, uh, the romantic period really, when writers like Wordsworth would go off on, you know, month long hikes, but they'd always take books for company. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a sort of tradition of, of walking with literature as a companion on your long journey. Um, and the walking library asks the question, what book would you take on a walk? And then it gathers those, suggest those responses creates the library and invites folk to walk with it and um, placing book and environment into sort of dynamic relationship and that's a project with another collaborator Misha Myers um, who's at uh, University, Deakin University in Australia uh, we've done about seven or eight editions of those each library very specific to the context of its commission uh, one was a walking library for women walking um, which was a, 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 an exhibition that actually Claire curated um, mm. with a conference and symposium around it. Um, and the collection for that library is very different than the collection for uh, what book would you take to rewild a city? <laughs> um, so I've got very diverse collections, all suggested by folk as the book that they would carry in that context. Um, and then we literally just read the book as we're walking and we share, and it's like a sort of mobile library on foot. Um, so there's one example of creativity and walking. I mean, it can be anything. I think, you know, that example shows it really could be anything. Um, and Claire's got her own fantastic examples, including Perambulator, uh, which maybe also touches a bit on access. And yeah, physical. absolutely. Yeah. So Perambulator is a walking project with prams, which is very much about the kind of shift in mobility that comes as a new parent. Mm -hmm. Um, and really uh, tries to sort of think through and explore collaboratively, usually with a group of people, the sort of real detail of the materiality of the street. So the textures, the, the previously unnoticed kind of obstacles that suddenly are very much in your face. But I think, D2, I just wanted to say something maybe about everyday creativities in yeah. relationship to the research, because... Yeah. Actually, that's that's a really important strand of it. Obviously, the walking artist strand is vital, but we're, we're also really um, excited by and enjoy very much enjoying exploring all of the examples of kind of real mushrooming of community led, locally led, uh, creative 
interventions things like rainbow trails you know people putting up rainbows in their window to make something to go for a walk to look for or the light up windows that have happened the window wonderlands i think that wonderlands they're called where a whole neighborhood will put decorations up in their windows yeah or the, got, the wandering stones or there are i mean d gave some examples before but we're yeah we're, we're really interested I in can, the um, just 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 to show you this just to give an example i've got some respondents quotes in front of me from the survey that we've just pulled off and um, someone said um i've i've memorized scent walks i would try walk past gardens on two parts where i'd encounter scented plants and trees daphne hannah sun coal roses lime blossom and musa Someone else says, I liked finding the painted pebbles. It felt that other people were present and made me feel part of the community. Um, someone else walked to observe wildlife and learn bird calls. I can now identify all common UK birds by their songs, which I've learned entirely during the pandemic. Someone else has taken old ordnance survey maps of the area and walked with them to see how much has changed and how much has remained. You know, and these are this is just like folk <laughs> thinking themselves about, well, how can I engage and be more engaged in my walking? That's just four out of we've got about 1,200 responses. They won't mm. all say creative things, but that's just a sort of random sample, really, of just how exactly Claire says the sort of everyday creativity of you know us, the citizens, you know. Yeah. And some of that's personal, just for the individual, and some of it's very much about connecting communities, really, mm. you know, um, reminding folk that they're, they're not alone, I guess, that, that yeah. these works are there to talk to them in some way. I think we should definitely end with that list, kind of embedding the voices that you've, you've generated as our kind of final work. So I, I really like that. And I love the idea of kind of remapping community spaces and kind of making the community the canvas on which ordinary people can, can create art in the way that they um, rework, remodel, remap the world around that's them. Lovely. I think that's fantastic. Um, you're doing wonderful, exciting, uh, empowering work. So thank you very much for coming on to talk to us about it. We'll put links at the bottom of the film for anyone who would like to um, learn more about the project. Um, but for now, uh, Dee and Claire, thank you very, very much. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you for having us, Andy. That was great to chat to you. Exactly. And great to hear your responses. I wish I, well, we'll be able to hear it on the recording and note down. <laughs>